Welcome back to The Nose Plays Endless Space 2. Uh, today is a very special video that I am recording on behalf of Amplitude Studios. Um, <clears throat> I was recently contacted by one of their forum moderators and told about a very special event that they're running this week and I wanted to go ahead and make a special video just for them to help announce that uh, week-long event. So, uh, without further ado, here is my special video. Uh, before we get into the actual video, I do want to take just a moment to jump out of game and show you exactly what I'm talking about. So, if you go to www.gamestogether.com forward slash amplitude dash studios, you will receive this lovely web page. And this has all the information that you need to know about uh, Amplitude's Endless Summer event, uh, including what exactly it is. Uh, there are some really cool things that you can get, uh, free Sega game codes on Steam, uh, some brand new wallpapers that they've released, some cocktail recipes, uh, and there's going to be a schedule of various events, streamers, um, for Amplitude's games, uh, there'll be a several guest streamers and then also some developers streaming. Uh, I believe there might even be a contest or two. So uh, here's the schedule. If you want to find out more, uh, come and visit the page and check out the cool event that they're putting on for the community. Also, check out the uh, forum uh, on this website. Uh, the Games Together forum for Amplitude's games is really good. Uh, there's some great moderators and devs that participate in there quite a bit. And uh, you can get a lot of cool information and interact with a lot of cool people that also like the Endless games. So uh, <clears throat> I wanted to point that out. Um, just kind of scroll down here and show off some of the content. And yeah, I will leave uh, a link to this in the description if you guys want to check it out. But uh, I would definitely encourage you to do so. Now, uh, back to my video. And this is hopefully going to be a relatively short video. What I've been working on for quite a while now, and I haven't been playing or even streaming much in a while, um, but I have been working on this video. Um, and when uh, Cat of Nine Tails reached out to me about his In the Summer event, I said, uh, I'm going to be on vacation during most of that week. I'm actually leaving tomorrow. But I have a perfect video that I would like to put together for you. And this is going to be my top seven tips, tricks, and things you need to know on turn one of any game of Endless Space 2. So hopefully some of these tips are things that you maybe didn't know, um, or maybe things that you thought about, but um, I'll reinforce them as being good things to pay attention to. Um, the first tip is actually going to be a bonus tip because uh, this is not a tip for all factions where most of the other ones are. Uh, this is a tip specifically for the Vaulters faction. And with the Vaulters, um, you have a very unique starting mechanic where you don't actually start with a system, but you start with your colony ship. Um, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you always settle the first system that you can see and reach. And if you can reach multiple systems, um, pick the best one of the ones that you have access to. In this circumstance, I have two lanes that I can travel down. Only one of them am I able to reach. And it actually happens to be a very, very good system for us because it has both the strategic resources that we're looking for. And so I would prioritize strategics over anything else except maybe Jadonics, but even then, um, strategics are really important for a Vulture starting game. So we're going to go ahead and travel over here and get this thing started. And we'll go ahead and colonize the better of the two planets. Um, so in this situation, I'm going to definitely colonize the system that has both of the starting resources on it so I can start gathering them faster, um, even if this would be potentially a better settle. So we'll go ahead and pick that one up. And then we'll get into my official list of things that you need to pay attention to when playing 
turn one of Endless Space 2 with all factions. So the first thing that I want to point out is something that I discovered a while back. Uh, and it's not something that I think everybody's aware of. And I don't know for certain how many factions have this issue. I think it's an issue. Um, it's something that you should at least take a look at. And that is your starting ship design. And specifically with the vaulters, uh, one of the reasons I picked them is because I know they have this issue. Um, so if we take a look at our starting ship, there's a couple of things that stand out to me. Number one, um, you'll notice the name fairing, but you'll also notice that as soon as the game begins, I have the ability to upgrade my ship for some reason. And this always kind of confused me until I started doing a little research. And what I've discovered is our ship design for the fairing actually has the upgraded engine module in the ship design. And you'll notice that this ship design has a movement speed of seven. And so if I come in here to edit, you can see we're looking at the upgraded ship engine and we've got a movement speed of seven. However, our starting ship does not have a movement of seven, nor does it have an upgraded engine. You can see this is the downgraded engine and this is a six. This is a problem for me, not because they don't give you the engine to start with, but because the name of this would seem to indicate that you should, because they match. And so that is one detail that I think you should pay attention to at the very beginning of every game of Endless Space 2. Check your ship, check the actual ship design by double clicking on it, and see whether or not it matches. The easiest way to know whether it matches is you'll, you'll have an upgrade cost here. If this is highlighted and there's a cost, clearly those two things do not match each other. I think this might be specific to the Vaulters as well, but I'm not certain. It could also be specific to any faction that starts with uh, better engines. And so definitely something you want to pay attention to. Now, more important than that is that you do want to go ahead and take your starting scout ship or ships and outfit them with the appropriate equipment for whatever task you want to use them for. If you plan to use them militarily, I would keep the weapons they have on them or even consider upgrading. But if you're going to use them primarily as scout ships in the early game like I do, there's a few things that I would highly recommend you consider. Uh, one of which this ship already does very well, and that is uh, two sets of scout probes. Not every faction has a ship that can equip two sets of probes along with a fair number of engines. Uh, this ship does. And so if you can squeeze in two sets of scout probes, that can be very helpful. Um, the other thing that you can do, uh, besides upgrading the engine, uh, I need to go to the other page. One second, we need to go to this page. We're gonna edit the ship design. Uh, so the other thing that you can do is put extra engines on there. And an important detail that you really wanna pay attention to is However many engines and upgraded or non-upgraded that you decide to equip this ship with, uh, you want to make sure that you take a note, a mental note, of what your top movement speed is. Okay, that is an important tip. Know what your scout ship's high, highest movement speed is after you've equipped it the way you want. Another thing that you can do that's really helpful when retrofitting your ships is if you look at the upgrade cost and the upkeep over here, if I pull a module off, that I'm not particularly using, the upgrade cost and the upkeep cost both go down. Uh, upkeep is based on a base value for each ship, plus an additional dust for every module, and higher tier modules uh, may cost more in upkeep. I'm not certain of that. Uh, but each module you equip increases the upkeep cost as well as the upgrade cost. Pulling extra things off <laughs> that you don't plan on using right away can help lower the cost and allow you to spend your dust in other ways. So, this is the ship design that I'm going to go for. It's only going to cost me 30 dust, and I need to remember that this ship has a movement speed of 10. And that's it for tip number one. Number two, very similar to tip number one, is hero planning. Uh, we're going to talk just a moment about our hero, Every faction will start with a hero, 
but not every hero is the same. And so one of the things that you need to do is, especially if you're playing a faction you haven't played in a while, take a moment to review your hero and decide exactly how you plan to use them throughout the game. Um, the most important thing to know about your hero is their starting bonuses. So this particular hero's starting bonuses are 5% additional shield capacity and plus 10 industry per anomaly on colonized planets on system. So if we were to start with a planet, a colony planet, uh, that has several anomalies on that planet and also within the system, this hero becomes very enticing as a early um, governor. Um, the shield capacity bonus does not lend itself to a very effective fleet commander at all. However, there are other abilities in the tree that might. And every hero basically has two paths that they can take. Uh, so most heroes, not all of them, but most have two abilities in every wedge of the skill tree. One ability will be geared towards captaining a ship and leading a fleet. The other ability will be towards governing a system. And so you can kind of decide which route you want to go. In my opinion, it makes the most sense to specialize each hero as one or the other. Uh, very rarely does it make sense to mix up the two types of abilities. So just pay attention real quickly to what your fleet abilities are. In this case, that would be those three abilities all have something to do with fleet mechanics or your governing abilities. So extra food, extra food and industry, and extra um, strategic resources. Uh, once you've made that decision, the next thing that you need to do is you need to decide whether you're going to attach your hero to your system or to that ship that we were looking at just a moment ago. And the reason that we wanted to get that ship retrofitted and remember the movement speed is because of this point right here. Uh, once we've decided that we're going to attach our hero to the scout ship, we want to make sure that we match their movement speed with the movement speed of our scout ship. Otherwise, one or the other is going to be slowing the group down. Uh, one little note, you can mix and match obsolete engines with uh, better ones to get to uh, various numbers. So for example, if I went like this, this is going to cost more, but it's going to give me extra movement that I don't get to utilize. By clicking the show obsolete button, or leaving the old engine here, I can get it to exactly 10 and it'll cost a little bit less. The other thing that I'm going to do with this hero is I've already decided after looking at her abilities that I want to primarily use her as a governor. And so because of that, I don't really need all of these extra modules um, because she's not going to be participating in any combat in the early game. However, I am still going to attach her to the scout ship because heroes can accelerate their levels really quickly by scouting anomalies with the scout ship in the early game. Um, one other thing that you can do, although I won't be able to do it with this particular hero, is some heroes have extra support module slots and so you can sometimes throw an extra probe on there as well. Uh, it really depends on the engine layout that you decide to go with. Because I went with 10 speed engines for my scout ship, I don't have an extra slot for an extra probe, but if I went with a lower speed I could actually throw another probe on here instead. Uh, by pulling all those modules off, I did get the upgrade cost down to 30 dust, and we'll go ahead and apply that. And then finally, we'll go ahead and attach her to my fleet. It's very important that you attach the hero to the fleet before you do any scouting with your probes. Otherwise, they will miss out on the experience that comes with scouting those anomalies. All right, on to tip number three choosing early tech deeds and unlocks so we're going to go ahead and move over to the tech tree for a moment and i want to bring your attention to a few things um, if you zoom out here you get a pretty good idea of the general gist of what you're starting with so you can see we start very heavily focused in the science tree uh, we also have uh, science 
law that we'll talk about a little bit later that lets us access two layers deep. So because we've unlocked this layer, we actually can get all the way out to rank three of the science tree. Unfortunately, we don't have any of these other wheels even started yet. And so while we can still research both the, the top and the second row, we're going to focus primarily on this first wheel because not everybody starts with the science party. And the main thing that I want you to pay attention to is what are the first set of abilities that you can pick up and which ones are going to be most useful in the short term. But I want you to also keep in mind and pay attention to the unlock bonuses. Sometimes these are missed when you are trying to calculate what the best thing to grab is. And so by grabbing one of these two abilities, we will not only get the, the things attached to that tech, but we will also unlock the tier two bonuses, which will include things like mining probes for the big ships, the behemoths, um, support modules of various types, and also deeds. And these deeds are not uncovered until you unlock them, but once you've played the game a few times, you'll understand what these deeds are and you'll know whether or not they're worth going after. Um, this one in particular has a very uh, likely chance to be useful to us because a lot of times it offers you a large cache of strategics, which are always useful for the vaulters. Um, but they are useful for every faction and sometimes they're not always strategic. Sometimes there are other things that can be very helpful as well. Um, so always check any deeds once you have those tiers unlocked. Finally, uh, this one, notice there's no bonuses here, but it will give us access to this deed, which is important. We can't achieve this deed till we know what it is. And then also in the military tech, grabbing one of these will unlock a number of new military weapons, one of which is particularly important. Um, this one actually adds capacity to your empire as far as manpower, um, but it also gives you access to uh, I'm thinking of something else anyways a, a lot of cool weapons that you can upgrade your ship with so it's not just these two buildings that we get by grabbing one of these techs it's also all of these so that's the one little tip that I want to give you is make sure you're putting that into your calculation when you're deciding which technologies to pick don't forget to check deeds don't forget to get to check the tier unlocks and continue to do that throughout the game, but particularly in the early game when you're making decisions, as those decisions are very important. Next thing that you want to do, tip number four, is going to be over here at the start of the game. Uh, typically, you'll get a couple of communiques that tell you something like, uh, you now know how to use this strategic or this um, luxury resource. And you will always get at least two of these. And there's a very simple reason for that. And it has to do with the fact that every game starts with randomly assigning a luxury resource to each faction that is part of your empire. As you collect new factions, you will get even more variety in these luxuries and these boosters are really powerful if you've never used them before i highly recommend that you take some time to make sure when you get caches of these that you're coming to this screen and popping these boosters basically what it does is it doubles the bonuses that your um, population produce for like 10 turns so if i were to pop a booster for two spuds uh super spuds I would do 50 damage to ground attackers and add an extra two science per population pip in my empire. So that's not a lot, but when your empire starts to grow very rapidly, uh, it can be very, very um, beneficial. Some of the factions or some of the, the races have even better bonuses, and these bonuses will also get doubled. So instead of plus two approval per population pip, I would get plus four. That can be really helpful in the early game to get you over a threshold uh, for approval ratings and bonuses. So keep that in mind. Always check your population boosters, know what they are. And then 
when you're out looking around in the galaxy and you start to uncover some of these luxury resources, you'll know which ones might be profitable for you to try and acquire. Tip number five. There is a little known detail that has baffled me on a number of occasions. And I'm going to point it out real quick. Um, I can't point it out without rolling the turnover, which I will go ahead and do. But that detail is every faction on turn one is missing some approval that they will receive starting on turn two. You need to factor that into your calculation when deciding whether or not you want to maybe grab an approval building early in the game or you want to run a law that affects your approval. And it's very confusing at first um, when you make these calculations on turn one and then you roll the turnover and all of a sudden your numbers don't make sense. Uh, and that bonus comes from politics. So there are political bonuses and penalties that your um, people will give to your system based on which political parties are in power. So for example, um, because the vaulters are scientists at heart, as long as the scientist party is in the government, I will get an approval bonus for them. I will also get bonuses for Sisters of Mercy if I have a religious government in power. And it works both ways. So any faction that is missing government um, influence will be unhappy and provide a negative penalty to your approval. And any faction that has the same government as their type um, in power will get a positive bonus. And those can kind of cancel each other out or lean one way or lean the other way. One of the things that happens throughout the game, especially now that we have the espionage system in place and the hacking system in place, is that governments can be flip-flopped on you. And you can find that all of your people are generally scientists and then all of a sudden uh, the government becomes industrialist and the scientist party gets kicked out and your approval ratings tank. And it has to do with this mechanic. Uh, but early in the game, I want to show you what happens. So if I mouse over my approval for this system, you can see that I'm getting a uh, base of 50. I'm getting a nice big bonus for my golden age. I'm getting plus 10 from core worlds and plus two from my one population pip of Sisters of Mercy. But when I roll the turnover, notice that it jumped up to 95. That's a plus eight. And that has to do from leading political parties in the system. So because most of my population um, like the scientist party, and because that party is leading, and you can see system representatives down here, scientist party, populations mostly made up of scientists, that's where that plus eight comes from. Um, it should always be plus eight for every faction that starts, as far as I can remember. Uh, so keep that plus eight in mind when you're doing those calculations at the beginning of the game and you're deciding whether to run um, some of these laws that we're going to talk briefly about. So that leads us into setting laws. Um, very important at the beginning of the game to take a look at the laws that you have access to and understand which ones are the best for you at the beginning of the game. Um, a couple of laws that I would highly recommend for most starts is the Cram for Exam Act. This can be very good to run for a couple of turns for many factions. Every faction has access to this law. Um, a little bit of extra science in the early game with a small penalty to your approval is not that big a deal. Um, you want to pay attention to the approval penalty. You can ride this penalty for quite a while before it starts to drop your approval enough that it actually moves you down a tier or keeps you out of a upper tier. So keep that one in mind. 
Um, it's just free science. As long as you're running it, it doesn't cost you anything else. As long as this penalty doesn't move you in or out of a tier that you would otherwise be in. The second one is Toys for Boys. This is a really important law throughout much of the game because it fixes a lot of approval problems with a fairly minor penalty. Um, plus 20 approval on system has a very interesting effect if you get it high enough. Once you move your approval up a tier, you'll get a significant bonus to food, dust, science, and influence. The cumulative um, bonus of all of those tends to outweigh, at least numerically, the amount that you lose in industry. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's worth it, but it is a lot of resources for a small penalty on industry. The problem is not all resources are created equal, and industry is very, very important in the early game, especially um, and even into the late game, but less so, particularly on systems that are very well developed and don't need to build any new buildings very quickly. Um, so you're going to have to do the math on this for yourself and see whether you would prefer with certain factions to have a little bit of extra food, dust, science, and influence over building things just a little bit faster. Uh, that is a very, very important law to consider and also consider on turn two you're going to get that plus eight approval from your political leadership being part of the government so it's actually more like 28 starting on turn two um, dirty hands act is not a law that everybody gets but it's a fantastic law and should always be considered unless you're building ships in which case if you do have uh, the warmonger lower fleet militarist law this one's really really good to have as well um, it can be beneficial to min max and micromanage this and jump back and forth between these two laws depending on what most of your systems are doing especially in the early game i can tell you from experience whatever your secondary political party is um, it is unlikely in many cases that it will continue to be your secondary party after the first 20 turns of the game so if you plan on using whatever law is being granted to you by your secondary party you might consider using it in the first 20 turns of the game otherwise you may not get a chance for a while all right that was tip number six the last tip that i'm going to give you today is one that I think most of you know about but one that a lot of us tend to forget about at the beginning of the game and so one of the things that I always like to do at the very beginning of the game is zoom out to this level and take a look at my constellation um, if you mouse over the constellation you can get some information on it uh, sometimes it will give you an indication of the size or even which other faction has control of the constellation uh, if you do not currently have control of it um, but knowing what the constellation bonus for your faction is can give you a little bit of an edge in a particular resource and having that knowledge can help you decide on what buildings to maybe focus on so for example because i'm starting in a region with plus 15 percent dust I might want to consider starting with more dust buildings in the early game and then quickly capturing this constellation to take advantage of that plus 15% bonus. Um, depending on what the bonus is, that strategy could change. It also can um, depend on what faction you're using. So some factions will get bonuses that really mesh well with them and other factions will get one that doesn't and maybe it doesn't t make sense to stretch into another resource that you're not naturally good at acquiring but it's always good information to have and all it takes is a little roll of the mouse wheel to zoom out and get this beautiful picture of the galaxy that you're in as well as some information on your constellation uh, one more little detail mousing over the constellation uh, the pop-up is kind of annoying but if you mouse over it like this you can see how it's flashing 
and sometimes um, constellations can be quite large and you'll have little bits uncovered in other portions of the uh, galaxy by mousing over you can figure out whether or not those bits are part of the constellation you currently are sitting in or whether they're different constellations uh, altogether that you have not quite discovered yet and that's the final tip for today so i hope you enjoy these uh seven tips tricks and things to know whenever you start a game of endless space 2 this has been the nose plays and you guys have a wonderful endless summer